Hello, Kedem viewers. Was Jesus left alone on the cross? Professor Israel Knoll from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem thinks he was. Professor Ishai Rosenzvi from Tel Aviv University has a lot of questions to ask about it. Professors, the floor is yours. Okay. Israel, I want to start with an image, a very famous image, the Pietà of Michelangelo in St. Peter's uh, Basilica in the Vatican. Every visitor know it. Um, Jesus, after he was taken from the cross in the hands of his loving mother. So it's very famous, it's very touching, but is it real? Did it actually take, take place? Well, uh, depends whom do you ask. According to the three older Gospels, namely Mark, Luke, Matty, there was a serious break between Jesus and his family. And we can't assume that they were there in Jerusalem <coughs> when he was crossed. Uh, they, they didn't join him in his last journey to Jerusalem. It is only according to the Gospel of John, which is the later, that his mother is present. According to Mark, even all his disciples who followed him up to this moment left him in the night when he was trialed uh, uh, by the Sanhedrin. Petrus, Peter, left him in, the, in this moment. All of them betrayed him. He was alone on the cross. He saw that according to one version that even God betrayed him. He said, Eli, Eli, lama shebaktani. My God, my God, why did you leave me? Uh, the only members of his Galilean, Galilean f group who stayed <coughs> faithful to him were probably a group of few women including Maria Magdalena, they, and only they, were there near the cross. Okay, so hold your horses, because in order to understand how he was abandoned by all his disciples and why, we have to go uh, back and start from the uh, beginning. So there's dozens, more, more, hundreds of reconstructions of Jesus' trial and, and death. And we will follow your version that you've published in a series of, of books on the history of Messianism. And I'm a Talmudist, you're a biblical scholar, but we share interest and may I say even love to this uh, literature. And so let's start from the beginning. And the beginning for the Gospel of Mark is John the Baptist. Later, there were um, stories of Jesus' birth and childhood were added, but we will start from uh, John the Baptist. What is the source of baptism for repentance, metanoia in, in, in Greek? And what happens to Jesus in this uh, event? I uh, mainly I follow Mark, and according to Mark, the John didn't know J Jesus. He was one of the many people who came to him to take uh, uh, baptism and to repent. And Jesus was there, and he heard the voice <laughs> from heaven, uh, you, you are my son, you are the beloved one. Um, and the question is, who was John? Why was he uh, calling people to come to the Jordan to take, uh, uh, to be baptized there in order to repent for, uh, repent their sins? Because we don't have it in the, in the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, in the Torah, uh, uh, baptism is there all over in, in Leviticus and, and, and Numbers, but not as a condition. That if you uh, uh, go inside the water, you become pure. The only group that we know 
that had such a concept in the time of Jesus is the mysterious group of the people of Qumran, the group of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But their ritual was different, <coughs> namely. Uh, for them, uh, uh, there was a daily moment of going into the water in order to clean yourself and repent <coughs> your sins. Namely, it's what, not a one-time event mm -hmm. like in John. It's something that happened every day. And the other difference is that they did not allow all people to come and go inside the water and becoming uh, clean and pure. They thought that only the members of their group right. would be saved. The other parts of the humanity will be doomed at the end of days. Yeah. So John the Baptist was possi possibly a former member of the group. This is mm. Flusser idea, yeah. Yeah. which I like, possibly. But he changed the view in a remarkable way. First of all, saving, redemption, forgiveness is open to everybody. Yeah not just to member of a specific sect. Yeah. And by the way, you know, it possibly the covenant of the community knew such a practice, therefore they, they explicitly say, Lo itar bechol mei rachatz. If you're not in one of the group, you cannot be purified. Water will not help you. And the other thing is that as it was not a daily event, it was a one-time event, so if you came to John and you entered the water of the, of the Jordan, this was enough. You, you don't have to repeat it every day. So Jesus' experience was the expected experience of this baptism to, to receive the Holy Spirit? I think that in his personal, psychological uh, understanding, while he was coming out from the water, he heard this voice. Nobody else, according to Mark, right. uh, uh, heard it or knew about it. John the Baptist, according to the Synoptic Gospels, he didn't know anything about Jesus. Later, when he was imprisoned yeah. in east of Jordan, he sent messengers to ask, who is this guy in Galilee? Are you the one yeah. who, who is coming? This means that he, was, he didn't know anything about Jesus before yeah. that. So from there, he, he uh, goes back to Nazareth, to his city, but he doesn't stay there. He moved to the villages um, uh, around the, the Sea of Galilee, dozens of kilometers from from uh, Nazareth, even today, it takes time to get there with all the traffic, uh, etc. So, um, I, and he says expl explicitly that he is despised, Atimos, in his uh, city, and he denies his family. How do you read this scene, and how is it connected to the, the biblical model of Elijah, which Jesus is identified with? Uh, uh, we see in the story of Elijah and Elisha that uh, when Elijah comes to Elisha and he just take off his mantle and put it on the shoulders of, of Elisha. And Elisha understand everything, even though no word was spoken between the two of them. And he asks him, ah, oh, please give me permission to go to say hello to my parents. And Elijah saying, oh, wow, I, I didn't say anything. Maybe I just want to take off a little bit. It's a hot day. This mantle is so heavy. What do you want? And Elisha gives up his wish to say hello to the family. He slaughtered all the bulls of the family and burnt 
uh, the tools and uh, made a great uh, meal for the followers of Elijah. Namely, he broke totally with his family. This is the meaning of the episode. So I see that for Jesus, uh, breaking with the family is a condition. He says clearly, if you want to be in my group, yeah. you have to break off with your family. I didn't come to unite family, but to break families. And what happened with his own family is shocking. They came to him, according to Mark, they wanted to hospitalize him. They saw that he became insane. This is the conflict. And he sent them off. He didn't want to see them. Yeah. He didn't want to see his mother. So contra to the Pietà, it is probably a long way break with the family and yeah. the mother that was not solved till the crucifixion. So according to this uh, story, the transformation led to a total break and a, a, a kind of new Jesus, new uh, image. And, and again, we have to, to understand what is this new image. figure is. So, so speaking in language of families and sonship, I would say that he acquired a new father in the moment when God spoke to him. This is what he heard in, in the Jordan, near John. You are my son. So his new father is God. Right. And he says to the disciples, you are my family. They, my natural family, they are not my family anymore. There is a new and different family, the family of the disciples. Yeah. And, and that's why marriage becomes so problematic for, for the, the followers. So let's move with Jesus from Nazareth to the villages around the Sea of Galilee, to Capernaum, Kfar Nahum, and to uh, Chorazim, and there He's known as an exorcist. Mm -hmm. And he command on the demons, mm -hmm. which is very impressive. Mm -hmm. And but it is mainly impressive for the demons themselves. Mm -hmm. And they are the first to identify him mm -hmm. as the chosen, as mm, the, son the, of the son of God. And they tell uh, they tell him repeatedly, We know you. Mm -hmm. We know. And he silenced them, just as he silenced his his uh, students, his follower, and he tells them, don't tell anyone. Uh, I, I see Jesus as a combination of three elements that were present in Judaism of his time <coughs> and were combined in a very wonderful way in his personality. And one of them, is the Galilean magic maker or miracle makers. Because we know people, and this was noted by several scholars, that Hanina Bendosa and others were pious people from Galilee who were famous in their ability to heal six children, etc., etc. So all this. Uh, I would say, set of miracles in Galilee, near the Sea of Galilee, are very natural in the framework of Judean, uh, uh, I would say, reality of Galilee in, yeah. in this time. Yeah. So, so this is one part. So he is a Hasid. He is Hasid. He is Hasid. And uh, a, a Galilean Hasid, devoted man. And there is another part of it, which is also very typical to some parts of Second Temple Judaism, late generations. The, the very sensitive moral teaching, the Sermon in the Mount, 
which is not in Mark. Which is not in Mark. Yeah. Uh, okay. Matthew. That's true. <laughs> but even though I'm not confined to Mark, I, I like to follow yeah. Mark, but not in every case. I think that the moral teaching of the Sermon of the, on the Mount is also something that we can compare, and this was done by Flusser, for instance, to Hillel the Elder. Yeah. Jesus and Hillel, the Jesus famous book, Hillel. Jesus and Jesus Hillel. And yeah. Hillel. So, so, actually, he is Hanina ben Dosa, the pious miracle makers. He is Hillel. And the uniqueness is the combination of these two elements with another element, which is the messianic okay, so, uh, so we uh, come uh, back to the messianic. Yes. So we're getting there in a minute. I just want to add one thing about the exorcism, which I think is also related to Qumran and to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because in Mark, at least, it's very clear that his fight with the demons is related to a kind of dualistic worldview. You're either related to the realm of God or to, so he, he kind of clear the way to the kingship of, of um, to the kingdom of God. Okay, this is another, I would say, uh, uh, good reason to assume that somehow in this or other way, Qumranic ideas were known to Jesus. He lived in the first century, and uh, Qumran was founded probably around 100 years BC. So he, this is... So you follow Flusser in, in yes, that? Yes, yes. So I think what you have just suggested is another link between Jesus and Qumran. Yeah. Uh, William uh, Vrede's famous thesis is um, that this is a later edition which is meant to somehow um, explain why the earlier generation did not know Jesus as a Messiah. And since we now want to present Jesus as a Messiah, since Mark want to make this the most fundamental, I would say, characteristic, we have to somehow explain why is it not known. And the answer is, this is a secret. Um, and in one way or another, I must say from the scholarship that I read, it is a pretty common to accept at least, you know, uh, the basic assumptions of Vrede. What do you think? First of all, I would like to say that Vrede and, and Bultmann and other scholars of that time and many others that follow them now in Europe or in the United States are people who in a way are a little bit unease with the messianic ideas. They prefer Jesus to be a great moral teacher which surely he was. The messianic is irrational. And there is some, uh, oh, oh, this is not so pleasant for us. So they try to push it aside, like the magic side. But specifically, let me start with Bultmann. Bultmann says, he wrote about Jesus claims that on the one hand he is elevated, he is the son of God who sits on the right <coughs> hand of power, but at the same time he is the suffering servant. So G uh, Bultmann wrote this rare and strange combination of being elevated to a semi-divine status <coughs> with the suffering of the servant is unknown to the Judaism of the time of Jesus. N because of, it, of this, we must assume, like Vrede, that it was created as a re by the church as a reaction to the crucifixion. This is Vrede. And I would 
reply to this and say, oh, Bultmann, you were right in your time. When you wrote it in the yeah. 50s you know, of the last century, this was yeah. true. His, his most famous uh, book on the history of the New Testament was published in Germany in 48. So he couldn't know. Yes, <laughs> but at the same time, when you were writing these sentences, scrolls were found near the Dead Sea in Qumran. And the scrolls taught <coughs> us many unknown things about the Judaism of the time just before Jesus. And one of these issues is that beside the <coughs> most common type of messianic expectations, it very much present also within the scrolls, the triumphal king who will defeat the enemies, etc. Victorious. Vi victorious, and he will kill, all of them will be killed, and he will be the new king in Jerusalem, etc., etc. You see it in many places. And there, and I, uh, I dealt with it in my first book on the subject, uh, but again now in my uh, uh, <coughs> current book, uh, um, the mes ab about the, the conflict uh, um, regarding uh, the messianic idea. There are like three signs, three documents that can attest that within the Qumran community there was a group. How many people belong to this group? I don't know. But it is there where we see exactly this combination. Namely, there's the famous hymn, self-glorification hymn, <coughs> mysterious. In the past, I have suggested the historical candidate. I don't know if I, I stay with it, but the document is there. And this person say about himself, I sat in heaven. There is no one like me among the angels. He's higher than the angels. But at the same time, he says, no one is suffering like me. And he uses the language of the suffering servant of Isaiah and apply it to himself. Namely, he is an <coughs> elevated suffering servant. And we have another document about a priestly figure. And this figure, it is said about him that he is atoned for all his generation and a lot of suffering. But he, his light is like the sun, etc., etc. So Again, the same combination. The same combination. And the third thing is that in the famous Isaiah scroll, the big Isaiah scroll from the Qumran, in the, in the words of, about the suffering servant, where it is said, Moshchat mi'ish marehu. He's uh, corrupted. His figure is corrupted, turned away, something yeah. like this. There is a change. Instead of Moshchat, Mashachti, I have anointed, namely, the suffering si servant is anointed one. Again, combination of messianism and suffering. So, now, I'm playing the skeptic for, okay. so I just want to add that uh, uh, this uh, idea of secrecy yeah. is something that um, is repeated in Mark specifically uh, in, in many contexts, not just in the context of the messianism, but the identity of Jesus in general, right? No one is allowed to, to tell, and, and some scholars at least think that it, it has a literary uh, goal, because if Jesus is known, there is no explanation for the interrogation and the, and the whole process. I would say that we have to remember Okay, as I explained in uh, my last book, uh, The Messiah <coughs> Confrontation, and we will come back to it, there was a great disagreement about 
the Messianic idea in general. We will come to it. Not everybody accepted the Messianic yeah. idea. But I would say, among the majority of the people who accepted the Messianic expect expectation and the Messianic ideas, the great majority was the expectation of triumphal Davidic Messiah. There is a very, very narrow line of other people <coughs> who are expecting a suffering servant type. And if you say to the people, as happened with Jesus in Jerusalem, the majority, many people supported him. When he went uh, down from Mount of Olives, they said, Oshana, Oshana, they blessed him. But when they understood that he is going to be a suffering Messiah, they left him. Yeah. Even the disciples. Yeah. And, and, and so he, this is yeah. something dangerous for your public relationship. Yeah. This yeah. is, in my view, this, the reason for the secrecy. Yeah. So, so you've sneaked in here something very important that I want to just um, kind of emphasize. There is a gap that need to be uh, explicated between the great support in Jesus before he is arrested, which is the reason that, that they were fear, that, 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 that they were hesitated how to arrest him because they knew that he has this great support and, and they had to do it in night and, and in, a, in a tricky way to his uh, kind of being totally alone uh, later, so much so that when uh, Pontius Pilate asked them whom to release, right? They say release the other guy, right? Other than, um, Look, other than Jesus. The Romans understood something. They put a sign over him, King of the Jews. Yeah. So they understood that some type of messianic expectation is involved. And they crucified him, which is a punishment for, for a rebellion. Political, yeah, political, political enemy. Of course. So, so this is a very good proof that the messianic idea in general was there. It was clear to the Romans. But the knowledge of this specific, esoteric, I would say even, kind of messianic They leader. didn't know the Dead Sea Scrolls. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The Romans didn't. So, so let's <laughs> no. move to Jerusalem. Yes. So with, again, with Jesus from the Galilee to Jerusalem, he gets uh, in, as you said, he is welcomed by the, the uh, uh, public. And then the, the famous gesture of uh, turning over the money changers' tables. Um, how do you read this gesture? Well, he, he, in my view, he wanted, uh, uh, it, it can be come from his moral sensitivity. This is he, he quotes Jeremiah, then yes. of, of robbers. Yes, so, so it can come from his uh, uh, moral sensitivities that we spoke about it uh, before. Yeah. But mm -hmm. some parts of his uh, words within the temple, just before the, the trial and the crucifixion, are very, <coughs> very interesting. You know, and, and uh, they are interesting because uh, they go against the tendency of the church. The tendency of the church is, and we see it in several of the Gospels, to <coughs> say Jesus is the son of David. But if you look on the Gospels, uh, uh, you see that he himself never used this language toward himself. He never says, I am the son of David. People call him the son of David, the person uh, in Jericho, the people yeah. on Mount Olives. But he never. <coughs> what he does is that few days before he was captured, he goes in the temple and say, why are the scribes saying that the Messiah is the son of David. It is impossible. I will give you a proof from Psalm 110 
David is talking to the messianic figure who is invited to sit on the right hand of God, and he called him my master. If he was his son, why yeah. calling him my master? N meaning, what is the meaning? The Messiah is higher than, the, than David. The Messiah is the son of God. A very good rabbinic homily by the rabbinic mm -hmm. midrash, by mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> as we know, the old version of Psalm 110, which is preserved in the Septuagint, the, the, the Hebrew text was, was uh, uh, heavily, heavily edited, contained a phrase, uh, the words of God, from the womb of dawn, I have created you, which is the, I would say, the, the, the most uh, extreme um, saying about the messianic figure as being biological yeah. son of God. This is not, not a as a metaphor, mm, not as a, a but the actual son of God. Yes. So Jesus was specifically building on this psalm. And this is against the tendency of the church. So it, in my view, there must be. It is reliable. Thing. So let us mention another figure that you mentioned in your book, which is Chaim Cohen, the chief justice at the beginning of the state of Israel, who took upon himself to acquit the Jews uh, from uh, uh, sentencing uh, Jesus, he thought that it is his role as the chief justice to uh, acquit not only you know <laughs> people contemporaneous people, but uh, um, but the the, the Jewish uh, people. And he argued that this cannot be Mark uh, narrative cannot be historical because it contradicts the the halacha as we know it. It was in the night. Uh, the conditions for to identify, you know, um, someone who cursed God did not, uh, were, were not uh, fulfilled. Uh, and what is your answer? I would say like this. I mean, we have to remember who are the judges and who was not coming in to the court. The judges were high priests, Scribes were connected to the temple establishment, but the <coughs> Pharisees, the rabbis, they did not take place. <coughs> John, who is late, in includes them, but this is unreliable. According to the uh, uh, older gospel, the synopt synoptic gospels, they did not, I can imagine, uh, Rabbi, Yohanan, son of Zakkai, or Rabbi Gamliel, in, in sitting <coughs> there in the eve of Passover, Passover depends when it happened, and there is a knock on the door, and they say, oh, the Kayafa, the high priest, uh, there is a Galilean person, we have to, uh, you are called to come to the court. And the rabbi would say, court, on night, according to our rules, we don't do that at night. And this is the Passover or the eve of Passover. We don't do it on Yom Tov in the, in the time of a high holiday. No, we don't do that. I'm not coming. Chaim Cohen is wrong by assuming that uh, the scenario should fit to the rabbinic halacha. There were no rabbis. The rabbis did not take place. Yeah. Would, this is one of the main claims in my book, would they come? Would they be part? The result would be they would totally, him. they would acquit him. We have two stories later about the trial of Paul and of Peter. In the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, and in both cases, the Pharisees said, oh, messianic ideas? We respect messianic ideas. Yeah. 
Nobody would yeah. die for messianic yeah. ideas. And Paul creates a coalition with yes, the Pharisees against said, the Sadducees. Yes, yes. We share the same yeah. belief in resurrection. So we are in the same camp. Yeah. You Sadducees, you are against us. Yeah. And, and Gamliel is, is, and the other members, the rabbi, rabbis, they are for Jesus because they basically believe, they don't believe that Jesus is <coughs> the Messiah but they share with him similar messianic expectations. Yeah. So this was a great tragedy that he was there in the court <coughs> in the hands of a minor <coughs> group of Jews, a group that disappeared few years later. The, the Sadducees disappears in the year 70 when the temple was destroyed. So he was trialed by a minor group, the majority of the Jewish people of this time would not accept this verdict. Regarding Chaim Cohen, if all the rules of the Mishnah in Sanhedrin apply to the first century, I I'm not even sure that they had really authority, that the Sanhedrin had authority to um, uh, judge capital um, uh, matters. It's hard for me to believe that any uh, Jews, Sadducees, or Pharisees would have a judgment in Passover. The priest had more urgent things to, to do on, on Passover, which is the most busy uh, day. Regarding the uh, Sadducees' uh, um, attitude toward uh, Messianism, we know some things for, from Josephus mainly, right? And from the New Testament, right? That they did not believe in any of this in angels, in providence, in resurrection, in any of this. Regarding the Pharisees, it's more complicated than that, right? You build on one very interesting composition called the Psalms of Solomon, mm -hmm. which is um, deeply messianic, especially one Psalm, Psalm 17, and you follow um, uh, scholars that assume that this is a Pharisaic uh, composition. I'm agnostic. I don't know. Okay. He, he may, you know, there were many people I think that were didn't identify with any of these uh, groups. They were just what uh, Sanders called uh, common Judaism. But uh, I, I don't know. But uh, but building on this uh, uh, composition, you assume that this was a major issue between the Pharisees and the yes, and the Sadducees. I, I, I would add, I didn't. Uh write about it. Uh, we, uh, uh, I mentioned the name of Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, who was sitting in Jerusalem and later on, after the destruction of the temple, he moved to Yabne and, and built the, the center of rabbinic Judaism after the destruction of the temple. <coughs> there is a story of, about his last words. And it is the, the combination there is so strange that for me this is a sign of, of, of uh, uh, reality, of historicity. He said in the, the moment when he died, he said, Panu abayit mipnei atuma veachinu kise lechizkiyahu melech hamashiach, something like this, okay? He was uh, uh, anxious about that he, w while he will, would die, he will be a source of impurity to the vessels of the house. So he said, okay, take everything out of, I don't want to cause you, uh, but you have a pre to prepare a chair for Hezekiah, who is the Messiah. And by the way, we know from the Trifo that this was the belief among Pharisees and r rabbinic people in uh, the time uh, on that period that Hezekiah is the, mas the Messiah. Yes. So, so yes, I he see. said, "You, I read these verses um, uh, about Jesus. You read it about uh, Hezekiah." Yes, and this is yeah. one thirty-five or yeah. er, around this period. <laughs> so I think that messianism in the Pharisee camp is not something new. It was there, Abba Yohanan ben Zakkai, before him. I don't think. I think that the great debate was with the Pharisees, as you said. Yeah. They didn't believe in resurrection. 
they didn't believe with in the Sadducees. Sadducees. Yeah. The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. Didn't believe in providence. Angels. Uh, angels. So what place you have for messianic yeah. expectation? Yeah. Further, I believe, and this is something that is very basic in the first part of my <coughs> book, The Messiah Confrontation, I think that this is a continuation of a biblical, a, a, a serious camp within the Hebrew Bible. So, so let's talk about the, yes. the Hebrew Bible and the different messianic models that you identify there. You identify basically three camps, um, the um, Davidic messianic uh, uh, son of uh, uh, God uh, model, mainly in the Psalms, right? And, and then the anti-monarchic, strongly anti-monarchic model in the Pentateuch, but also in some of the, in the prophets Hosea. In, in, in Hosea. Hosea. And then the suffering servant in second Isaiah and, and following it. Do you see monarchism and messianism as a one sequence in, in, the, in the Bible? Uh, well, uh, uh, someone who rejects uh, monarchism would also reject the, the Davidic messianism because it is connected very much to it. But I think that there is something else here. It's not just the uh, rejection of monarchism, but it is the rejection of the monarchic ideology which the people of Israel imported with monarchy itself from the neighboring countries. Because when they came to, Solom to, to Samuel, they said, please appoint on us a king like all the nations yeah. around us. And they the were law, very honest. Yeah, <laughs> and the law of Deuteronomy also says, if you want to have a king like the nations around you. Mm. But in the nations around us, we know it clearly from Egypt, Mesopotamia, Canaanite texts also in some degree, uh, the king was not a regular person. He was elevated to a divine status. He was a son of God. He was eternal. So when you imported the monarchic idea, you imported the monarchic ideology with it, that your king is elevated. He is a son of God. He is eternal, etc., etc. So the other camp, which is in the Torah, they said, what? Do you say that the king is a son of God? But didn't we establish biblical religion on the idea that God is above biological process? This is why we rejected Asherah and Anat, and we don't have a divine family like all the Canaanites around us. So you bring it back for the king? <coughs> Chas v'shalom. This is... Meganoito in Greek. Yes. <laughs> this is blasphemy. And this is the claim of the high priest. When Jesus is brought before him to the court, he said, and it's very interesting, the language in Mark, he said, he can't say, are you the Messiah, son of God? Because he would not pronounce yeah. the words, right. son of God. For him, it's a blasphemy. He said, are you the Messiah, the sons of the blessed one? And we know that Hamevorach. Makarion. Yeah. Yes, Hamevorach, the blessed one, is a typical title of Second Temple period. Baruch et Hashem Hamevorach. And Jesus, according to Mark, answers, yes, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting on <coughs> the right hand of power. It doesn't say uh, right hand of God. He said power, gvura, which is another typical yeah. title of God in that period. Because yeah. of this. Dynamis. Yes, yeah. these titles were so correct for the time 
I rely on the historicity of, of the, the uh, mark. And, and what happens then? For the high priest to hear that a person says about himself, yeah. I am the son of God. I'm going to <coughs> sit on the side of God. This is blasphemy. And the verdict is clear. It is the rule of blasphemy in Leviticus 24, death penalty. You, do you assume that people distinguished between these different models? I mean, didn't people read the Bible at that time harmonistically and some had to, uh, how, how did this model um, preserved in, did they preserve in by uh, different communities, the, the priestly and, or from reading, you know, that uh, we, we don't have any evidence that the Psalms were accepted by the Sadducees. Do we have any evidence that they accepted the, the Psalms? We, we don't know that we they don't didn't. Know. We, we, we yeah. don't know. They're not Samaritans. They didn't have just the Pentateuch. We, yeah, we don't know what, possibly, the, what their Bible were, was made of. Possibly they had uh, the, the Pentateuch and Kohelet. Yeah. <laughs> we see. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Seem to be a Sadducean yeah, yeah. book, but I don't think that they, I mean, to accept all the, all the Psalms. Uh, Messianism, w which was a huge deal in uh, First Temple um, society and a, a very lively debate, um, somehow disappeared. Oh, uh, when the Sleeping Beauty in the second temple from the Persian period to the first century BCE, more than 400 years, and then was resurrected. Yes. Uh, speaking I, about resurrection. I, 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 I really, I used the, yeah. the, 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 the image of the so, sleeping so, beauty. So, so. Namely, that after the disappearance of Zerubbabel, uh, who was the first messianic leader in the Persian period, shortly after the rebuilding of the temple, we don't hear anything about messianic expectations for 400 of years till the establishment of the Qumran community. And this is a resurrection or a waking of the messianic idea. But, but how do you imagine this happening? I mean, in order for ideology to be resurrected, it, it has to be somehow, you know, alive or, or someone had to, to pass it, to remember it. I, um, argued, and I, I've, 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 I, I told you it, I also published it, that maybe liturgy was the, the tool through which these expectations were, because we have this psalm in, in uh, Sirach, in Ben Sirah, that uh, seemed to me to be early and... Uh, and at the end of the uh, yes, of Sirach, yes. uh, not original to the book. No, but, but so how very do we, how early, do we, because how speaking do about the, the Bnei Tzadok, right, see, the Tzadokites. Okay, so okay, I, I can except I have no problem with an argument that uh, uh, a low key of messianic expectation was preserved. But then it burst. But it was not, you know, yeah. uh, uh, probably I've suggested, uh, following Flusel, that at the moment when the Hasmonean rulers called themselves kings, this was the issue that uh, uh, brought the people at Qumran to say, well, well, you want to be, uh, we, we can accept you possibly, K yes, no, as a high priest, you're, you're a priest from Modin, but kingship is reserved to the tribe of Judah, not to you. Okay, so b before we end, there is one elephant in the room that I want to okay. <laughs> uh, acknowledge. Let's visit the safari. <laughs> and, and this is the, how reliable is, is Mark's story? And, and you, assume a, you assume a kind of high level of reliability. And it's true that Mark is the oldest gospel that we have, but it is late, later than the events in mm -hmm. the, in the um, around the, the year 30, in, in uh, dozens of years and between these events and mark something else happened which is the destruction of the temple 
um, and uh, probably and and Jesus in Mark prophesies the the, the destruction of the temple. And, and now Mark is not and and. Uh, th this is now my perspective. Mark is not Josephus. He does not have a historical agenda. He tells a biography of a founder, full with miracles and, and wonders, the more the merrier. And, and the picture from the sources that we do have that are earlier to Mark, which is Q, the source, Quelle, the, the source of Jesus saying that does, is not in Mark, but is integrated in Matthew and, and, and Luke. There, the key is eschatological, the preparation of the kingdom of heaven through moral um, uh, um, acts of the community and uh, through baptism with Jesus, right? Um, joining uh, 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 Jesus, etc. Is it not possible uh, uh, for you that there is different Jesus in, 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 in this uh, ongoing uh, narrative. There is a, uh, um, a book by Paula Fredriksson, From Jesus to Christ. And, and Mark is one stage in this story where Messianism became the uh, founding uh, uh, characteristic of Jesus. When Vrede published his book about the Messianic secret, he, there was a criticism in Germany by a scholar named Albert Schweitzer, who described Jesus as a eschatological prophet that wanted to move uh, the, the, the process by giving his life. And there was a harsh debate. Possibly some of the reasons for Albert Schweitzer going to Africa is this debate. He was uh, a doctor. He was a doctor. He was a great musician, a, yeah. a genius. <laughs> uh, but he wrote very important yeah. uh, theological books. Let me say like this. Uh, is claim to be the Messiah unknown in Jesus' time? The truth is no. Jesus was born in a post-traumatic period just before the time of his birth, in the area of Nazareth, there was a catastrophe of the breaking down of the rebellion of 4 BCE. After Herod's death. After, which broke out immediately after the death of Herod. There were three messianic leaders to this rebellion. One in Galilee, Yehuda, the son of Hezekiah, from the famous family of rebellious, yeah. they ended up in Masada. Yeah. The other one, Antrongus, in, 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 Antrongus in, in the mountains of Judea. The third one, Simon from Pariah. They crowned themselves. This is mentioned also by Roman historians. Yes. So the very claim that I am the king of the Jews was there just in the eve of the yeah. moment of the birth of Jesus. Yeah. So why wouldn't we accept that the language of yeah. being a candidate uh, was known to him? Yeah. It was in near his yeah. house. And, and as you said, it was not a problem for the Romans yes. to, to assume that Jesus was yes, um, considered they assumed, the, the king they, of the they Jews. They said, okay, yeah. oh, eve of Passover, yeah. the, the, the rebellion of 4 BC started in the eve of Passover. Yeah, yeah. So maybe this is another And of course, version. messianic expectations yes, are, yes, yes, you yes. know, um, uh, the so, Passover is susceptible so to why, this. Why we have to, to say, no, 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 Messiah is too much. Only a eschatological prophet. Yeah. Messianic claimers were there all the way. Okay. Point well taken. So let me uh, summarize and, and say that, um, so I, I cannot say that I kind of um, carte blanche sign on all this, but it is fascinating and brilliant reconstruction of the polemics and, and give this whole issue, this whole uh, the, the set of events, a larger context, long durée that uh, begins 800 years uh, before that in 
um, um, uh, Isaiah and Hosea and uh, in, in, in Judea and Israel. And so thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Through the conversations uh, with you, uh, new things are gaining new light. <laughs> thank you.